Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the second part of the lecture I'm giving on the Catholic teaching on human sexuality. This is a continuation of last week's lecture that opened this topic. We begin our class in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, in our last class, we treated briefly the final part on justice and peace, the Church's teaching on justice and peace, with particular attention to war and peace and the theory of a just war. Now we're coming into, uh, in this second part of the lecture, we moved into human sexuality. And I began that talk last week on introducing this topic, which is very, very complex. It is based on something I taught previously on law. What is moral law? And if we go back to our class textbook on page 276, you have the definition of moral law and natural law. And when we deal with sexuality, we are dealing with the moral law and the natural law. And I'll just quickly review this on page 276, where it says, answering the question, what is the moral law? And it goes on to say, the moral law contains God's prescriptions for right human contact, con conduct. Moral law contains God's prescriptions for right human conduct. It teaches us what is good and how to attain eternal happiness. And there are four interrelated parts of moral law. The first one is the eternal law. And then from that, the eternal law is what comes to us from God himself. Then you have what is called revealed law. And then from that, you have natural law, and finally, civil and ecclesiastical law. So you have eternal law, natural law, revealed law, and civil and ecclesiastical law. These laws are prescriptions, basically codes or legal, um, legal writs on what to do, what is right, what is wrong. St. Thomas Aquinas, the great philosopher, once defined law as an, ord an ordinance of reason for the common good. Laws are established by civil society out of a sense of reason that is reflected, uh, discerned by the body enacting the law. For what? To achieve the common good. And this goes back to a couple of lectures ago when I talked about this common good. And then the natural law is the law that is written in the soul of each person. We go back to this idea that sexuality, our, our human sexuality, is given to us by God. How? God created us. He created us in his image, and he created us with two identities, male or female. And it is, these, it is through this sexuality of male and female that we see how we relate to God. God is supreme. 
We are his creatures, and he created us in his image, male and female. And this goes into then, what is the natural law? And then from this, the natural law is revealed to us in our own religious traditions in the scriptures, both in the Old Testament and in the Gospels and the epistles of the New Testament. These, we believe, are God's way of communicating with us. We have in the Gospels the new law, the, no, the law that Christ brings through his teaching as the Son of God, bridging the gap between divine and natural law and revealed law all through his person. And the fundamental, uh, found, the foundation of all this is to promote love, grace, and freedom for all people. Now, that was the big definition I gave. And then we started looking at different aspects of moral theology that rise from these, uh, these, these principles. And we talked about justice and peace. We talked about human freedom, etc. At the heart of all of this, at the heart are the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are important as the building blocks on which we have developed our views of what is right and wrong and what we need for moral life. Now given that, we now come to this stage where we're talking about human sexuality. Going back on what I had said earlier, human sexuality our identity as male and female is aimed towards the explanation of human marriage. Marriage is a covenant, a sacred promise that people freely make and they intend to keep faithfully for life. Sex, sexuality, is the sign of that covenant. It is what draws the male and female together, together to form a communion, a union, and through that procreate and continue the human race. Sexuality is also, as I said in my last class, a source of human pleasure and joy for the couple. Because as they achieve their purpose in marriage, the good of the spouses, and the transmission of life. These are, there are four principles of marriage. Two of them that are very important are people get married for the good of each other. It's something that the church only started teaching recently, but they've always upheld it. But it became part of the law only in recent years. You don't get married to punish someone. Sometimes you think they do. But you, don't, you do not choose a person and marry that person in order to make them miserable. That is the sign of a psychologically dysfunctional person. You marry someone because of love with the understanding that the two of you together will help build a better future. You will work towards making each other better. So marriage is for the good of the spouses. It is also for the intention of, yes, having children and bringing new life to the community. Sacramental marriage is a sign of God's love. We say that the sacrament of marriage, where a man and a woman join together to, for the good of each other, but also to procreate, create children, is a sign of God's own fruitfulness, God's fecundity. And he creates us for this purpose, to continue us, continue our human nature, our race. And so this is one of the importance. Now, this human relationship and sexuality given by God defines how we relate to God. We relate to God as man and woman. If we eliminate this relationship to God from our sexuality, 
you begin to eliminate a lot of other things. They kind of go on the wayside. And I'll explain that a little bit more as I go into some specific details. The desire, for instance, to have a, for instance, to have a baby is very good. And the church blesses that, but it also has rules against using artificial means to achieve that end. For a conception to be morally right, for a conception to be morally acceptable, the sperm and the egg must come together as the result of human sexual intercourse the physical expression of love. It is not allowed, as I mentioned in the last class, the church does not accept IVF, in vitro fertilization, which is done outside the womb of the woman in a test tube and then inserted into the womb, nor do they allow the implantation of sperm into the woman's room, womb by medical means known as AI, artificial insemination. And so I gave all of that in the last class, and then I tied it into our understanding of the Sixth Commandment. With that, I then went in very brief briefly to the virtue of chastity. Our sexual identity also draws us, pulls us, um, gives us attractions that sometimes have to be tempered by our intellect and will. And so here, chastity is the way of tempering, controlling, so that it, it elevates us beyond the animalistic urge of simply relieving ourselves when we have sexual urges, as pets do, cats and dogs do, animals do. Human beings do not. And so chastity is about the inter integration of our sexuality in our entire human nature. Chastity is, hel helps us to model our life on the Christian values we have inherited. Every person, whether they are single or married, is called to be chaste, to be healthy, to be honest, and to respect the sexuality of themselves and of others. I'll repeat that again. Every person, whether they are single or married, celibate, they are called to be chaste, to be healthy and honest, and to respect the sexuality of self and of others. And so, the ideal would be to control our urges until the moment when we are ready to make this commitment for life with another person in marriage. The church's hope and uh, higher hope and expectations for us, but they also understand the difficulties caused by society. But we tell people, don't fall into the trap of, I can do it because everyone else is doing it. Because sexual respect and integrity are very important in living out the Ten Commandments. You shall not covet thy neighbor's wife is a warning against lust. Lust which pulls us in places often we don't really want to go. And so we, this is, these were areas that I mentioned in the last class. And now I'm going to get on to uh, one other issue that will lead to some others. And that's going to be on the question of marriage and same-sex relationships in the teaching of the Catholic Church. This is a very, very controversial issue. Just this morning, before I came here to this class, uh, to this lecture, I was checking some things on the various theology websites that I, I, I look at almost every day for about an hour. I go through various websites that have tremendous resources available for priests and pastoral workers if they simply would take the time to look. And uh, there was a very interesting article 
uh, that I, I came across this morning, uh, and it's not from our own church, not from the Catholic Church, but in the most uh, uh, basic Christian principles, and it comes from a professor of theology in an Anglican church communion, meaning the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church. And uh, this theologian, the article was written only a week ago, and he's talking about a tremendous dilemma that the Anglican Church is facing today because of same-sex marriage, the question of people of the same sexuality being allowed to marry. And he begins his argument saying theology, theology over here, is inherently pastoral. The teaching about God, the theology, the science of knowledge of God, what I'm doing here, is inherent in pastoral situations. And pastoral theology by its very nature is theology. The pastoral approach for us who are Christians, who see ourselves defined by our relationship to Christ, is that of that leads to theology. These are not one against the other. They are the same, one and the same. And one of the problems we're facing in the 21st century is that we tend to overstate our identity only in terms of sexual identity. We seem to say that that's what I am. I am this or that. We have the various definitions, uh, heterosexual, homosexual, transgender, uh, this, that, the other, the, the whole list, what we call the alphabet list. I don't like to use that because it is very negative, but it's how people see it. Just now, you, one of the terms we're learning, cisgender, cisgender, what is it? This word. I went to look it up because I hear it a lot. And from Greek, I think I understand it, and I found out I did understand it. Cisgender is the gender I am assigned at birth, male or female. On my birth certificate, as I am born, I am given a gender. And there, at the time I was born, there were two possibilities, male or female, based on what? based on our physical attributes. And 99.9% .9 it was very clear. There will always be that 0.001% of people born with both male and female genitalia. But we do not make a law based on that. The vast majority are born male and female. On top of that we have the science that teaches us that DNA, that, that unique identity that each of us has, DNA has a chromosome in it that defines us as male or female. That cannot be changed. It cannot be altered. It cannot be erased. It cannot be anything. It is there. And it cannot be broken up or, or changed to something else. And so in the article, this article that I was reading, that what they're saying is that quite often in the modern world, we are caught up in this sexuality and identity, or sexual identity. And people tend to identify themselves by this. So instead of saying, I am a Christian, or I am a Catholic, they're going to say, I am a heterosexual Christian or I am a gay Christian, or I am a transgender Christian. And this human identity, this refuses to understand that human identity does not lie in sexual orientation. Our human identity doesn't identify with our sexual, not our identity, our sexual orientation, what I am pulled to. I can be male and pulled to another male. I can be female and pulled to another female. 
I can be male and be pulled to an animal kingdom, etc. That is a sexual uh, orientation. But we're talking about sexual identity. And here, our identity from creation is to be in union with God, for Christians in union with Christ. And so that's my only label. I am a Christian. Without any adjective added to that. And the other problem is, when we start using labels to reflect our identity, we're pulling away from who we are. We're making a subtle shift away from theology into a pastoral approach that is not theological, but more popular. You don't start a letter, Dear, uh, dear Gay Catholics. That, that, that is... Because what it does is it separates a group from everyone else. What we're saying is we address dear Catholics, dear people of our community, without defining them by small groups. That's ghettoism, dividing people into a small ghetto. And what happened in the Anglican Communion is because they had moved very quickly towards accepting the idea of same-sex marriage, the bishops themselves are divided on how they will teach this and how other bishops will or will not go along with it. One of the archbishops who refused to go along with this idea said, when, will we, when are we going to learn that we cannot accept feelings to dissipate our faith? Well, I feel this or I feel that or how can you be against this? Or, uh, we are, our, our faith is not based on a poll. You know, the 50%, 60% are for or against. It is based, based on a relationship I have with God. So rather than blaming the churches or our Christian heritage for singling out a particular sin, such as homosexuality and same-sex unions, we should really talk about the hardship that is caused by these same-sex attractions and how can I pastorally help people caught in that. We go back to the most basic principle of moral theology. The church condemns the sin. The church does not condemn the sinner. Again, the church condemns the sin, the sin of murder. But the church teaches us to be merciful and pastorally oriented towards the murderer, not condoning the murder, but helping the person who is caught up in the sin, similar with almost any sin. So here, in terms of sexuality, we are not condemning anyone who has a same-sex attraction. We are condemning the sin of same-sex attraction, but working to help them become integrated even with this extra burden they carry. And so and, and uh, it, it comes down to gender identity. Uh, we have now, you're asked to be either cis, cisgender or transgender or whatever. We're saying why? We have gender, male and female. And as I mentioned in my last class, which when God created us, he created only two genders. Everything else is man-made or man attempted man-made. You cannot change what God has done. Simply a discussion of turning oranges to apples or apples to oranges. And I'll come up with that image again in a few minutes. We should keep in mind that the primary role of the church and our pastoral care is to help anyone who feels alienated from God. So if my relationship to God, based on my sexuality, but not in the positive way, in a negative sexual identity way, is causing me to have a faulty or a flawed relationship with God, then the church works to help me overcome that difficulty, to, in a way, right 
rightened my relationship with God. And that's the key pastoral issue of the church. Not condoning, uh, um, we, we don't condone the sin. We don't condone the sin. But we're going to help people to live in the nature they have and make a better relationship with God. Also, pastoral, pastoral context of uh, when dealing with people in this situation is not the feeling of exclusion from other fellow Christians. One of the difficulties is when people use this sexual uh, identity as their primary who they are, they are in a way cutting themselves off from the wider community and in a way putting two parts of the community at odds with each other. That's not the way we do this. It's what we are trying to do is our sexual identity is wedded to our relationship to Christ. Now, using that, I'm going to go into, and I, and I will say very um, from the beginning, I am depending here quite a lot on a bishop in the United States who is also a canon lawyer and a lawyer, Bishop Thomas Paprike, who I know I've met at various canon law conferences. And he wrote an excellent, excellent expose a couple of years ago on the whole concept of same-sex relationships, marriage, and the Catholic Church. And he gave this address as a bishop, but it is based on his own experience and something that happened to him uh, very um, at a time when he was still a priest uh, working in a parish. He's going to use two examples, one of which is the horrendous, uh, barbaric murder of a young 21-year-old college student in the United States by the name of Matthew Shepard. Some listening to this class, especially people in the United States, would be very aware of this name. It was a murder that took place in Wyoming in 1998, so 22 years, 23 years ago. This young man was beaten to death and literally left hanging on a fence. His murder has been called a hate crime and has been judged by that legally because they say he was murdered because of his sexual identity as a gay man, as a young gay man. If you Google his name, the last time I Googled it, it's well over 12 million results. 12 million people have Googled his name to get to his story. Now, Bishop Paprocki then says, I'm going to give you another name. And this person, uh, her name is Mary Stockowitz. Stockowitz. And Mary Stotowitz was murdered in 2002. Mary Stotowitz, if you Google her name, you will be lucky to get almost 27,000 views. Matthew Shepard, 12 million. Mary Stotowitz, 27,000. It's a huge difference. How was Mary killed? Mary was also brutally murdered, but in a circumstance that is not popularly correct. She is a gentle, she was a very gentle, devout, 51-year-old Catholic mother of four children who had two jobs. During the day, she worked in a parish as a secretary, and that's how Bishop Paprocki came to know her he was a priest in that parish. At night, she worked in a funeral home. And in the funeral home, there was a young uh, foreign-born worker who happened to be gay. And he was 19 years old. And what Mary had attempted to do in her own deep spirituality, her role as a mother and a woman of great deep Christian empathy, she tried to help this young man 
move away from his gay lifestyle, which was affecting his relationship to God. He was also a Catholic, like her. And in working together, she empathized with his struggle, but also was trying to help him elevate himself away from it, not condemning him, but condemning the sin. But what happened is that he was infuriated by her gentleness, her attempts to help him, and he then beat her, stabbed her, strangled her to death, and then stuffed her body away in a crawl space in his own apartment, which was above the funeral home where they worked. It took days for her body to be recovered and for the murder to become public. At all the time she was missing, the man who killed her joined all of her friends and colleagues in prayer sessions praying for her to be found. Okay, two murders. Both murders were senseless. Both murders were absolutely brutal. And we all condemn both murders. The taking of human life in such a fashion is never acceptable. However, the fact that there were over or close to 12 million searches and interests in the story of one murder over against hardly a blip in the story of the other indicates where popular sentiment in our 21st century lies. And it lies on the question of same-sex relationships. It's on everyone's, it's on everyone, in everyone's mind. I don't think a two-week period goes by in Hong Kong where we don't see, in the, at least in the English press, some story about this. And in the international press, it's almost daily. But the point that Bishop Paprocki is taking is that in the light of popular opinion today, it is an uphill struggle difficult uphill struggle to persuade people of why the church's position against same-sex relationships exists and why the church is against civil laws that allow these marriages. And he, re he reiterates, we do not base our theology and our faith on popular polls. If anything, St. Paul taught us that's not the way things go. And I'll go back. I, I always go back to one of my favorite references to the, in the Acts of the Apostles. We have that wonderful story of St. Paul. This is Acts chapter 17, verse 32. When St. Paul is in Athens, and he's on the Areopagus, just below the Acropolis. The Areopagus is the, it's a lower hill, just under where you see the, all the great famous uh, ruins of the temples of ancient Greece. And there, St. Paul is engaging daily in the Areopagus, in the, <clears throat> in the market area, debating with people as they pass by, standing on a rock source, a higher ground, uh, where when we went on a pilgrimage a year and a half ago, we were able to, to climb that hill to get the viewpoint of Paul and where he stood as he engaged with people and talked with them and debated with them. Some of them were Epicureans, some of them were Stoics. These were the two great philosophies of that period. And Paul got into disputes, debates with them. And some of them reacted negatively to Paul, saying, what is this crazy man trying to tell us? He's crazy. He doesn't agree with our view of philosophy. And that's probably the way we look at anyone who tries to argue against now the popular opinion of same-sex marriage. What's wrong with you? Why are you getting involved in this? But then the story in the Acts goes on. While some of them sneered at Paul and joked about him and made fun of him, others were intrigued because he spoke from passion. And they said, maybe we'll come back and listen to you again. 
on the same topic. And that's towards the end of this story in chapter 17. Some may be sneering, and it may be lucky that that they went away without doing any throwing rocks at him. Also, may be fortunate that some decided to come back. And as we hear at the end of the story, in verse 34, some of them not only came back, but they became believers. And that is the hope that Bishop Paprocki has in this very lengthy, very erudite speech he gave about this topic. He begins with the nature of marriage. What is marriage? And he reminds us, marriage is neither a state nor the church. Neither the state nor the church created marriage. Marriage is something natural, and it's the natural outgrowth of human nature. The story of Adam and Eve is simply a story that explains this natural state in which male and female were not only created, but they were created with an attraction of one to the other. And that th this is who we are. So marriage grows out of a natural affinity, a natural attraction, and complementarity of male to female. In other words, the ways in which one gender completes the other emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And that's what marriage is. One gender completing the other emotionally, spiritually, and physically. All three properties. But the inclination, the natural desire, and capacity towards procreation and creation of a family can only be fulfilled through the union of a man with a woman, of a male with a female. What they're saying is there is this attraction to also begin the foundation of a family, to procreate, to in a way imitate God's uh, fruitfulness in creating male and female, the, the, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, all these kingdoms that are built upon these complementary genders of male and female, to now build on that in order for us to have children and to have this desire for a human family. So the inclination towards these goods of marriage are clean, keenly felt by human beings. Even those who have same-sex attraction, they want to have a family. But couples of the same sex lack the capacity to realize the goods of natural marriage for the simple reason that they lack the complementarity of male and female. That seems harsh, but it is the reality of what we teach and what we believe. So St. John Paul II, uh, over a series of two or three years, early in his pontificate, gave weekly talks on what became known as the theology of the body. Uh, these are all collected now into a book, all of his talks on Wednesdays, over the course of about, I think, 18 months to two years. And one of the key points he talked about is that marriage is a separate institution with a distinctive interpersonal nature. The institution of marriage provides a justification for the sexual relationship between a particular relationship within the whole context and complex of society. So, to explain this a little bit more, I have to just give me a second. The air conditioner is at double freeze and I am freezing. The inclination of a male to a female to have a child is to build up the family. The family is the first primary initial fundamental complex 
of human society. Two people coming together to form a third child to become a family, and the family is the foundation of civil society. We do not have a society without first individual families that then come together as a group. So the institution of marriage is the moral evaluation of their love. It gives the context of their love and relationship because, it's because they love each other and they love God. This whole thing is a human creation to now the child becomes the symbol of their love. That's why they have children, out of love. Not because they don't want children, they hate children or whatever, no. And so you have this, all of this is part of what the church sees in this. Despite the widespread practice now, uh, and this is what Bishop Apraki is going on to, the widespread practice and acceptance of same-sex relations, he goes on to say, he reminds the Catholic community he's talking to now in the 21st century that even at the time of Paul, this was a struggle. In the Greek and Roman cultures, neither Greek law nor Roman law that had vast um, writings and, and stances and experiences of same-sex attraction, they never sought to grant legal status to same-sex relationships or even to define them as marriage. They had the, uh, they had the acceptance of same-sex attraction in their culture and in their philosophy, but they never moved to make this a legal precept or to raise it to the rank of legal marriage. And so this is something we also have to remember. Now, going back a couple of lectures ago, I was when I began introducing moral theology, one of the first lectures dealt with the beginning of the theory of utilitarianism during the period of the Enlightenment. And I was explaining the philosophy of uh, well, the great people that founded all this, uh, Jeremy, um, I have to find his name again here. It'll come to me in a minute. But one of the problems with this is that historically, during the, from the time of the Enlightenment going forward, the standard for ethical norms and laws became empirical evidence, what I see around me. By employing this pursuit, uh, they were talking about the pursuit of the just, to, to create a just and reasonable society, and to advance this society along scientific methods. And in a way, they wanted to control even nature. And so they, what they began is they said, um, they were looking at the social taboos and superstitions of the time. Ah, I came to the, na the names. Jeremy Bentham and Stuart Mills. Jeremy Bentham and Stuart, John Stuart Mills, I'm sorry. Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mills, in the period of the Enlightenment, developed these theories of utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest amount of people. And they were, they were building this whole sense of rationality on the idea that all ethical questions of right and wrong can be seen in terms of measuring how much your position maximizes pleasure and minimizes pain. That's all. The greatest good for the greatest amount. How do we maximize pleasure and minimize pain? But the obvious difficulty with this and what I pointed out a number of lectures ago about this is that there's no way of really measuring happiness or measuring what's the best good or what's the most joy-filling uh, experience I can have. For instance, I can be a person who is a sadomasochist and loves pain. Does that mean that that's good for everybody? No, by no means. There, there are people who think the intensity of pain gives them pleasure. 
How can you, you know, most of us would not agree with that viewpoint. You also have people who are dealing with what are the consequences. And those who believe that the ethically correct position is the one that most advances the over good, overall good of society are going to face a problem. They're called the consequentialists. We look at what's going, uh, what's going to be the ends. What are we going to get from this? We don't care about how we get there. We just want to get there. And that's a very murky area of morality where the ends justify the means. See where this is going. The ends justify the means. And that is not accepted all over. And so this idea of picking where is going, what, what is going to be my greatest good? How can I get there? What are the ways I can, I, I can control things to make things more pleasurable becomes what we call in the 21st century moral relativism. I'm not basing it on a moral principle, but on relativistic theories. And so this was very highly condemned in a very famous homily by Pope Benedict XVI on the eve of being elected pope. It was the beginning of the conclave after the death of St. John Paul II. Cardinal Ratzinger gave this homily, and I remember listening to it, and I was very struck by how perfectly argued this position was. And he was talking over against what was most popular at the time, moral relativism. And so here, what he's trying to say is we cannot make all of our decisions on good and evil based on how we feel, on empirical, em, em, empirical evidence only. We have to consider what is justifiable. Now, in civil societies, uh, I'm going to get into things that may get me in a bit of trouble here, but I'm going to try to read it exactly because the way Bishop Papraki phrases it is very tightly put together. He says this, civil societies and the state are acting properly in accordance with reason when they base their legal systems on warranted claims that are attested to by empirical evidence. So one is warranted in believing that society has an important and vital interest in preserving, promoting, and defending marriage and families as composed exclusively by heterosexuals. At the same time, given the fact that the state itself would be endangered if families based on heterosexual relations were threatened, the state is at the same time warranted in refusing to grant legal recognition to same-sex marriage. Now, I have to be very precise. We are talking about the legal union of marriage. I am not talking about other forms of legal recognition of a union that is not a marriage because there are legal properties to protect a brother and a sister leave, living together in old age, two siblings, or children with parents who are living into old age together. And there the society builds protections for them. And they can make the same protections for a same-sex couple living together in this kind of a civil union. This is not a marriage. Uh, and I have to be very careful there because people who are lawyers will understand the nuance. A civil union is not necessarily a marriage. A civil union can be other things, as I mentioned. It could be a combination of parent to child, brother to sister, relative to relative, etc. So having said that, a red redefinition of marriage to include same-sex marriage 
according to the way we see this, is beyond the competence of the state. Because marriage precedes the state and is a necessary continuation, uh, a necessary con condition for the continuation of the state. Because without marriage and families, the state has no future. Again, that's a very tight legal concept. The redefinition of marriage to include same-sex marriage is beyond the competence of the state. Because marriage, going back to what I said here, precedes the state. Marriage produces children, children produce families, families produce the state. But the state of marriage itself comes before the state. But without family, the future of the state becomes jeopardized. So when a state enacts a law saying that a same-sex relationship can constitute a marriage, it has the power to enforce that in a society's external practices. It can do that in a society's external practices, but it is devoid of a moral legitimacy because it is contrary to the natural law. The natural law, again, precedes these man-made laws. If the government says that, and I'm going now to something I said earlier, if a government says, I'm holding an apple, but it is now not an apple, it is an orange. I know it's an apple, but the government says, no, 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 we're calling this now orange. And then they say, everyone must now call this an orange. It is no longer an apple. And if you don't, I will punish you. Anyone who calls the apple an or uh, who doesn't call the apple now an orange can be put in jail. That is totalitarianism. The abuse of raw power that would not change the biological reality of the apple and the orange or male and female, but the whole question of what this is. The whole reality, I'm holding an apple. It is not an orange. I know it is not. My intellect tells me it not. It tells me it's not. And now the state says, oh, it is. You're wrong. We are defining reality for you. And so when we play with the definition of marriage, the state is doing the same thing. I'm going to quote something. Just listen carefully, then I'll tell you who said it. Everything within the state, nothing against the state, and nothing outside the state. Everything within the state, nothing against the state, nothing outside the state. That was said, defined, by the, ninth, the 20th century Benito Mussolini in Italy. He was one of the great totalitarian uh, leaders and he headed the movement of fascism in Italy in the 20th century that then made an alliance with Nazism in Germany and created World War II. He was, like many of the other isms of the 20th century, Marxism especially, they were seeking a Marxist utopia, a perfect state. And in response to this in the 20th century, the church had to refine its own teaching on the ethical principle of subsidiarity, which holds that it is not legitimate ever for the state to interfere in the fundamental nature of the family. In this view, it is never legitimate for the state to decide that it will use marriage and the family simply as instruments to be, un uh, to be manipulated to achieve their own goals and cultural uh, manipulation or control of a people. When the state basically takes over marriage, it is the family that loses. 
And I have lived in states where this has happened. And I've witnessed it myself. I've also seen the effect on people. Where the state determines how many children, if you can have children, how many children, and things like that. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole argument of that. That comes into the church's Catholic teaching on freedom, which I did very briefly a few lectures ago. Going on from this definition, the state has a duty to preserve and promote marriage as an institution that precedes the state, but at the same time, the state does not have the authority to fundamentally redefine the nature of the institution of marriage. The state, for, uh, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples how this works. The state has the authority, as they do here in Hong Kong, to enact rules of the road. Rules of the road. We have signs all over Hong Kong. We have tremendous traffic, you know, many, many cars, roadways, etc. And you have rules of the road in these traffic signs and in the regulations of traffic that protect those who drive vehicles as well as those of us who are in the vehicle and those who are walking by the roadway. Now, the state has the authority to enact these rules about cars, vehicles. It does not have the authority to change the laws of physics. Think about that. They can make laws, but they can't change the law of physics. That's the, the law of physics is a scientific, much higher authority. So they cannot change the law of physics so that the car crashes will be less destructive. You know, a car crash is a car crash. You might try to put down the speed limit or raise it or whatever, regulate the speed limit, but you cannot prevent a crash. That is based on the law of physics. The state assesses the pre-existing factors that influence safe driving. So the legislature will sit and look at what are the factors that influence driving safely, and they will then pass laws. You have to be so old to have a license. You have to uh, uh, not, you have to learn how to drive a car responsibly. You don't get in the car, turn a key, and go. I'm going to go off on a tangent. I live in Happy Valley, as everyone knows, next to Leighton Hill and Carolyn Hill. At the bottom back side of Carolyn Hill, we must have two dozen driving schools with dozens and dozens of vehicles that block our traffic every day, Monday through Sunday, with young people learning to drive. And I go crazy when I'm behind six of them and they're all afraid to make a right turn. We've all seen it. I have to always remember as I'm losing my patience, I was once in that position when I was 17, 16, learning to drive. But why do they have to have them all on the same road around the arena behind us? Well, okay, now I'm back back on topic. Sometimes I want to get out and run and kick the car in front. No, I won't go there to get them to speed up. Okay, so they'll say, you have to first be of a, a sufficient age to drive. You must take lessons to learn about driving safely. You have to, they look at the effect of alcohol, drive without drinking. And then they have to look at the best way to construct roadways and when to put up lights and turn signals, etc., and how to maximize speed limits. All of this uh, is to create rules that best accord the existing realities of the physics of driving. So the rule is not to change the physics. It's to somehow help people who are drivers be safer. So it's the same with marriage. They can define different things around the state of marriage without actually changing the fundamental law of marriage. So 
if people advance the idea that the family is subordinate to and dependent on the state, then you fall into this area where the state now controls the family. You have turned the law upside down. Where we see the family as coming before the state, before it, if you are now letting the state fundamentally, totally control the family, it reverses everything that we believe. The state exists to serve the family, not the family to serve the state. And that's another important issue. Now, the church's teaching on same-sex orientation and marriage is a Catholic position. And the reason we call it that is because it is based on what we see as the definition of divine law, natural law, and, and the way law has been passed on to us through the scriptures. One of the ancient doctors of the church, Cyril of Jerusalem, wrote, The church is called Catholic or universal because it teaches fully and unfailingly all the doctrines which ought to be brought to men's knowledge, whether concerned with visible or invisible things, with reality, the realities of heaven or of earth. In other words, the conclusion that a same-sex relationship sh should not be afforded legal status is there because it is based on the truth, not just of Catholic teaching, but of the natural law. But saying this is very controversial. If, if I were says, I simply said just that without any nuance, people would have, and they probably people listening to this, might have a very different opinion, and they would say, well, there's something wrong with you. But here, instead of saying that the truth is the reason that we are basing this on truth, and this is now where we're going to come to a very controversial 21st century problem. Instead of holding that truth is the reason that same-sex relationships should not be given legal status because it offends those who deny the existence of an empirical truth, they want a world that is based on the dictatorship of relativism. That was the term Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, used in this famous homily. We are in a world that doesn't want truth in capital letters. They deny it. And the way they do this is very simply, and I have already argued this in homilies, for those of you in my parish, you know, there is no such thing as my truth. And yet, that is what we hear a lot. Well, my truth tells me. No, no, no. Truth is an absolute. It is not mine or yours or his or hers or theirs. It is there. It is up there. Truth is absolute. So if you acknowledge that truth exists, then we can discuss and argue about whether or not the Catholic Church correctly understands this. But if you deny that there is such a thing as truth, the truth, not my truth, your truth, his truth, whatever. If you deny that there is an absolute truth, then the matter becomes merely the exercise of raw political power in terms of who has more votes to impose an agenda on others. I see this sadly playing out in my own country in the United States now, in a, in, in a way that I find very disturbing. Uh, things are passed in, in uh, Congress by a simple majority vote without looking at reason and, and not considering that a good 50, 50, when you have something being passed by one vote in our Senate or a 10, 12 votes in our House of Representatives, that does not represent the views of the majority by any means, because there is an absolute divide. There is no attempt to reconcile, and there is no attempt to look at the truth. 
I defy many people um, who, many people in law, you know, senators, congressmen, legislators, everyone in law is bound by a constitution. And I wonder how many have actually read the constitution of the nation state to which they belong. When I began studying canon law, uh, one of the, uh, not one, but a number of the courses deal with civil law. And with, in our own uh, heritage coming from the UK, the common law. And one of the greatest gifts we received in the course on United States constitutional law was the Constitution. And I remember reading the Constitution in my second year of high school, secondary school. We read it, but at the age of 14, 15, what did I remember? To read it again as a law student and understand the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the two documents that, that form the foundation on which all the rest of our legal precepts, precepts and prescriptions are based, is something very critical. And um, just the, the book I received as a gift from my, my professor of constitutional law, um, she knew I was very interested in many of these topics. And she gave me the, what they would call the introductory textbook on constitutional law, a massive work of 900 pages, huge. That is the simple commentary on the Constitution and all the different clauses of the Constitution and the amendments. And so here, that becomes for us the truth. It's not mine or yours or his or hers. It is in the document. And that becomes the basis on which we argue. But too often I see political discourse reduced to feelings. It has nothing to do with feelings. It has everything to do with truth. And so going back to St. Paul and his talk on the Areopagus, we preach Christ crucified, as we had in uh, last week's uh, second reading, a folly, an obstacle, a, uh, a stumbling block for those who don't understand our truth, the, the truth of the church. But for us, it is the absolute. Uh, I have to look, the cross is over there in the classroom here. That is the truth we look to, Christ on the cross. And that tells us what is right or wrong. My relationship to God is what is central. It's how I define myself. Not whether I am this or that sexually, not whether I am attracted to this or that, not whether I feel this or that. No, I am a son or daughter of God. My relationship to God who created me defines me. Nothing else. I don't need other adjectives to my name. You know, I, lo I love, you know, at the end of my name, I put M.M. That, that's the community I belong to as a missionary. Um, ever since I made it through my canon law degree and looking at one of my favorite professors, Dr. Beale, Father Beale, who used to tease us all the way through our courses of canon law, waiting to get that coveted license of canon law, J.C.L., after our name. Well, it was... I, I went through blood and sweat and tears to get that, and I put the initials behind my name uh, because I can. Sorry, it sounds arrogant, but I know what I went through to do that. Now, I want to do one or two more things to finish the course today. First, on uh, going back to same-sex attraction, homosexuality. The divine law is a rejection of homosexuality. And it is based on a passage in Genesis chapter 19 and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I want to also say that all of the biblical texts, you can pull them out, but they're not meant to label someone with a same-sex attraction as wrong. They're meant to simply talk about the sin of same-sex attraction. And it is found in various um, passages, both in the Old and New Testament. 
And we're simply saying the scriptural teaching, what we would call the, uh, the divine law by God, is that this is wrong. This is not why God created us male and female. That's all. That's the tr truth. God creates us male and female, and he gives us gender for complementarity. End of that. You move on to the natural law. And the natural law talks about when you have same-sex attraction is here what you're talking about some will say this is unnatural why because the complementarity of the human of the sexual organs doesn't work that way now again i'm not going to get into a very um drawn out description of this but it is simply that in the same way other moral principles are considered unnatural and unacceptable, such as murder, kidnapping, physical mutilation, emotional abuse, etc. In other words, we're not we're not pulling out one group and labeling it. There are other ways in the natural law that different things are considered unnatural. It is unnatural for a mother and a son to be physically and sexually attracted to each other. The sin of incest. Uh, this is almost a natural law through many different cultures. Um, there, and so that falls on there. You have people that will argue, I didn't choose to be this way. And that's, yeah, that's fine. No one chooses their sexuality. Their sexuality is given to them, and it grows and develops. Your sexuality has two different things. It is both a natural emanation of who you are, but it has some elements that are controlled by society around you. No one chooses, for instance, hopefully, no one chooses to be an alcoholic. But you can be habituated to alcohol, habituated to alcohol. Just as one can acquire alcoholic desires, I want to be intoxicated, I want to get drunk, and you can consciously choose them. I'm going to go into that bar and have a drink. The same happens with same-sex desires. It's there, you have it, and you have fantasies about it, you see pornographic material about it, and you consciously choose this. But the church is saying here, just as alcoholism has to be controlled, people go through programs, Alcoholics Anonymous, to control their alcoholic behavior. So too for any kind of sexual dysfunction. A genetic predisposition towards another person of the same sex is something that is considered uh, in, in psychiatry now, this is another problem. Because of popular views, psychiatry and psychology are, in a way, nuancing their definitions so as not to offend people. But, uh, and so it's becoming now uh, where maybe 10, 15 years ago, in the psychiatric manuals, they would say this: these are the the, the kind of uh, feelings or, or obstacles that people of same-sex uh, orientation are going to confront, now they're going to be a little bit more nuanced in that. And, that, and that's a problem for the people in this. Uh, all of these stories uh, about you know, people of same-sex attraction, there are many articles out there on the church's view of them. Uh, I have a couple of articles that I use. What I'm simply trying to tell people is that, like sexuality itself, all of us are called to be chaste. That is the value, the virtue, the principle that we aim for. And we are called to live the values that lead to chastity, live the virtues that support chastity, and live following the principles that enhance chastity. I do not uh, as an adult, I am meant to control any inordinate desires or feelings I have. And it's a sign of maturity that you are able to do this. And this is also why the church has such strong 
Catholic teaching on the area of gender dysphoria. And I'm going to end on this topic here. Uh, this is a very, very difficult topic. Gender dysphoria is uh, to be uh, the idea of changing your gender. And there are different levels of this, but one thing I will give you, I'm going to write it on the board and ask, ask you to Google it yourself. Dr. Paul McHugh. Dr. Paul McHugh is one of the leading psychiatrists, doctors in the United States. At, and he works out of Johns Hopkins, which for those of you who know medical schools, John Hopkins is the premier or one of the two or three top medical schools in the United States. And his medical school was at the forefront of this idea of biologically changing sexual reassignment surgery. Sexual reassignment surgery. It's a polite way of saying brutally cutting off or cutting into or changing uh, sexually a person from male to female. This was called transgenderism where you actually change the gender. Dr. McHugh, who is the, was the distinguished professor of psychiatry, this is the, the, the leading professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins, for three decades was on the board of physicians doing this form of sexual reassignment surgery. And at the end of three decades, he came out writing a book called Psychiatrist, Transgender is Mental Disorder, Sex Change is Biologically Impossible. Now, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. McHugh didn't write that. McHugh wrote his textbook on this on sexual reassignment surgery, where he says, I have for three decades dealt with doctors doing this, and I am saying, I deal with the psychiatry of the mind of the person undergoing this. And in the end, I realize we can't change this. The sex change operations are not helping people, but hurting them to be even more disordered. What I read as the article, there is an article by, um, by a man named Michael Chapman, and in it he talks about uh, Johns Hopkins and about Dr. McHugh, and that's where he writes, psychiatrist, meaning Dr. McHugh says, transgender is a mental disorder. Sex change is biologically impossible. And then he goes on, and I, I, I would ask people to, again, Google Dr. Paul McHugh at Johns Hopkins or the article by Michael Chapman, C-H-A-P-M-A-N, on him. And he will get, you will see the wonderful exposition of how he sees this, that there are things you just cannot do. You cannot change the psychosocial adjustments of people who go through surgery, this radical surgery. No matter what you do, many of them go into it for the wrong problems. Many of them are sexually ambivalent. But society, uh, now in my own society, parents are not allowed, in one sense, to interfere in a child's sexual questioning. On the other side, you have what I find, actually, sexual abuse. Parents allowing a a little boy to dress up as a little girl and raise the boy as a girl. That's a, a form of abuse. Children go through a questioning stage. We all did this. You go through a questioning stage, what am I, until we understand male and female characteristics, roles, etc. But the gender identity movement goes against the natural law. 
God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, nothing else, not transgender or anything else. And it's not just us. Other religious groups, the Judaism, Orthodoxy, other religions, all are fighting the same idea that people can manipulate what God has created. You cannot. There was a famous, very famous um, ad years ago in my own country, don't tempt Mother Nature. Don't try Mother Nature. Never try to outdo what God has created. Now, I would, uh, as the final word on this, I would ask people to look at this whole concept, if you have questions on it, go to the article by, uh, about Paul McHugh, written by Chapman, and his views on this, and on transgender teachings. The other one is um, from the Orthodox Church, and it's a, an article that was printed in 2016, and you can find, again, on Google, by Moira McQueen, M-C-Q-U-E-E-N. And this article is called Bioethics Matters, Catholic Teaching on Transgender, Gender Dysphoria. Uh, you will see it. You can find it on Bioethics Matters. And uh, this is the, the way it looks. And uh, I would recommend this also for anyone who wants to get more information about this. Now, with this, we are coming to the end of this whole section on this subject of human sexuality. I would end with something from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. On sexual identity and complementarity. This is number 2333 of the, Catholic, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It says this, Everyone man and woman, should acknowledge and accept his sex sexual identity, physically, morally, and spiritually. And it's to see that this is difference and complementarity are oriented toward the goods of marriage and the flourishing of family life. The harmony of the couple and of society depends in part in the way in which this complementarity needs and mutually support, support uh, which the complementarity needs and mutual support between the sexes are lived out. Okay, very bad translation. The harmony of the couple together is needed by society in order to fulfill its own obligations to build up the human family. And then the next uh, areas are on chastity and homosexuality, where they talk about the relations between people of the same sex who experience an ex exclusive or predominant sexual attraction towards persons of the same sex. They are saying it has taken a great variety of forms through the centuries and in different cultures. Its psychological genesis remains largely unexplained. How, knowing, knowing psychologically what occurs in an individual that causes the same-sex attraction. That is not, still not known. Basing itself on sacred scripture, which presents this same-sex attraction and it, the acts of it as a grave depravity, tradition has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. They are contrary to the natural law. They close the sexual act to the gift of life. They do not proceed from a genuine affirmative, effective and sexual complementarity. And so under no circumstances are they approved. But then it goes on to say, we are called as Christians and believers of Christ to treat people who have this problem in a merciful way not to have any form of discrimination against them, because discrimination is against God's will. These persons, just all of us, are called to fulfill God's will in our lives as Christians and to unite ourselves to Christ on the cross. 
And it is how each of us does that that we will be judged. And so, people of same-sex attraction, like all of us, are called to chastity. By the virtues of self-mastery that teach us inner freedom, at times by the support of disinterested friendship, by prayer and sacramental grace, they can and should gradually and resolutely approach Christian perfection. So I end this section on that, and we will have a whole new topic moving forward since we are now going into the fourth week of Lent. We will be now addressing more directly for our elect the Easter celebration, the baptism, confirmation, and First Communion, the rites of initiation of our elect. Thank you very much.